We are back again after a few days with our old theme, Astronomy and Astrophysics. So today we have among us Dr. Unnati Kashyap, who is currently working as a postdoctoral research associate at Texas Tech University, USA. As you are already aware, she will deliver a talk titled An X-ray Study of the Most Exotic Object in the Universe, which I believe is a glimpse into the world of X-ray astronomy. So before beginning the talk, let me give a quick introduction about the speaker. So Dr. Kashyap did her B.Sc. from Cotton College and thereafter completed her master's from Tespur University. She then started her PhD journey from the Astronomy, Astrophysics and Space Engineering Department of IIT Indore. And after her PhD, she is now working as a postdoctoral fellow at Texas State University. We are, of course, excited to hear more about her research experience during the talk. So students, please feel free to interact with the speaker and post any queries you might have after the end of the talk. You can also type your questions in, in the chat box throughout the talk, which will in, communicate with the speaker at the end of the talk. So now let's begin. Over to you, Dr. Unnati. Yeah, thank you for the nice introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Unnati. I'm a postdoctoral research associate at Texas Tech University. I hope you can hear me, right? Yeah, yeah, you are audible. Yeah, okay. So uh, today I'm going to talk about the most exotic objects in the universe, and I'm taking it really informally. So I would love to discuss all throughout the presentation. Please be interactive. So yeah, I'm a photography enthusiast. So here I am sharing a picture of the night sky that I clicked here in the backyard. So this is a night sky and this is me and my pet enjoying the night sky. Just kidding, that's not me. So this reminds me of one of my favorite songs by Coldplay. Uh, and the lyrics goes like, look at the stars, look how they shine for you. I'm assuming some of the people in the crowd are fan of Coldplay. <laughs> okay, so now I'm done singing the song, remembering the lyrics. The first thing that comes to my mind is how these stars are born. So away out there, there are huge clouds of dust and gas. And the stars are born as a protostar inside these uh, big clouds of dust and gas, and we call them giant molecular clouds. And here I show two pictures of beautiful giant molecular clouds. The left-hand side picture is known as a horse head nebula. You can see a horse head like structure here. And the right-hand side picture is known as a eagle nebula. I hope you can see an eagle here, right? So these uh, molecular clouds are composed of molecular gases. And the protostar inside this giant molecular cloud becomes denser and hotter, sorry, becomes denser and hotter. And then they start fusing hydrogen into helium. Then once the star starts fusing hydrogen into helium, then it enters the main sequence phase of its life cycle. So now I'm going to ask you which star is closest to us. Can anyone tell me? Anyone? If not, I'm going to proceed. Students, you can type in the chat box also if you are afraid to speak up. Yes, uh, I think someone has typed Proxima Centauri. We'll OK. OK, so. What about the star that is uh, visible during the day? Now, can anyone tell me what, what star is it? The star that is closest to us. The sun. Yeah, cool. I was talking about the sun. OK, so, so a medium star like our sun, inside it, what happens is that hydrogen fuses it to helium which produces the energy of the star. So a normal star like our sun inside it, there is a delicate balance between the gravity and the gas pressure. So the gravity is trying to come, uh, contract the star and collapse it onto itself. And the pressure due to the nuclear fission is trying to push it outwards. So there is a balance between gravity and the gas pressure. And this pressure is trying to hold up the star against its gravity. and try to keep uh, the star in an equilibrium known as a hydrostatic equilibrium. So here I show the equation of the hydrostatic equilibrium. So we can say that a star is okay when there is a balance between 
the gravity that is trying to pull it inwards and the gas pressure that is trying to push it outwards. So a star like our sun, it ends its main sequence uh, when it runs out of its fuel. So one day sun will grow and it will swallow all the planets as far as the earth and then it will become a red giant. And this will be the beginning of the end of the star or the sun. So what happens after that depends on the mass of the star. So a normal star like our sun will collapse and it will become a planetary nebula. So planetary nebula are the most beautiful objects in the universe. You can see from the picture, this is one of the planetary nebula I have shown here. So after that, the outer layer of the sun will drift off and the inner core would become a white dwarf. So again, this planetary nebula would be the fate of a medium-sized star like our sun. Like it can go up to seven times the mass of the sun. So this planetary nebula is known as butterfly. Here you can see structures like butterfly here. Okay. So if the star is much more massive than the sun, then it will have a very different life. So it will fuse heavier and heavier elements, and then it will become and uh, become, uh, and it will grow and would get a size of around thousand times the, that of the sun. And then uh, we can see here as it grows. So what would happen is that it would uh, build up to iron and after iron it can fuse far further because it doesn't have any more energies and the core then collapses and outer layer would also bounces off. And within just a second we'd see a blast like this. So the outer layer, layer would be blasted off in an event which is known as a supernova. Here I show a picture of the supernova event and the core of the supermassive star would then collapse into a a uh, neutron star. If the mass of the star is higher, then it would, uh, gra the gravity would be so strong that it would collapse into a black hole. Here I show a picture of the supernova, known as a crab nebula. So now, uh, here I give the overall picture. We started with the giant molecular cloud from where we get the Everest star, like our sun. Then it would grow into a red giant star, and then outer layer would drift off, then it would become a planetary nebula and the core collapses into a white dwarf. If it goes the other way around, it would become a massive star, then it would become a red super giant star, then it would become a, uh, it would undergo a supernova event from where we can get either a neutron star or a black hole. So these objects like white dwarf, neutron star, and black hole are the obje exotic objects, and they are very dense, and they are known as a compact object. So, to give a better picture, I'm sharing a video here. Hope you enjoy the video.
Uh, okay, so I hope uh, you enjoyed the video here. So now I have shown the whole cycle of the uh, star. So yeah, okay. Now I'm gonna talk to you about the neutron star. So this is our sun and this is the neutron star. So you can see what is the size of the neutron star, but don't let its size fool you. Even if the neutron star can cover around the diameter of a small city, it can weigh around 1.5 times the solar mass. So it is extremely dense. It has a strong gravity. And if you try to scoop out the neutron star with a small teaspoon, it would weigh around uh, 10, uh, 10 billion kgs. So you won't be even able to lift it. So these objects are known as compact. They are extremely dense. and they provide you the platform to study strong gravity and the ultra strong magnetic field, which is not available uh, terrestrially. So here I show you the whole picture of the neutron star, the internal structure. It composes of outer crust, inner crust, outer core, and inner core. And the density varies with the radius like this. So the outer crust is composed of atomic nuclei, free electrons. Then inner crust is composed of neutrons, atomic nuclei, and free electrons. Then you go to the outer core, which is composed of free electrons, neutrons, protons, or muons. And that coexists in a soup. And we still do not have much idea about the inner core, which is still mysterious. But we assume that it is mostly composed of elementary particles, which behave in a very unpredictable way. So. As I was talking about the neutron star, they have extreme gravity, they are dense, but they have a very strong magnetic field as well. So the magnetic field of the neutron star is billion and trillion times greater than that of the Earth. But there exists some neutron star which is around 1,000 times greater magnetic field than that of the normal neutron star. These are known as magnetars. Here I show a picture of it, and these are the magnetic field mostly. So there exists some neutron star which produce streams of light, and this light flashes in and out of our vision as it rotates. So these neutron stars are known as pulsars. So they rotate very fast. The fastest rotating pulsar rotates around 700 times per second. So you can assume a ball that is rotating 700 times per second. That is how fast a pulsar is. So now, uh, let us go back to the night sky. So we were looking up at the sky, then we were seeing the stars. But most of these stars has companions. They have a partner. And they orbit around the common center of mass. Center of mass is the uh, mass of the system around which uh, the whole mass of the system is equally distributed. So here I show two stars orbiting around the common center of mass. And they are gravitationally bound to each other. Those are stellar bodies. So to understand how they are gravitationally bound, I am going to talk to you about some basic physics like equipotential surface. These are the surface that joins the points that are having equal potential. So if this is art, I try to draw some equipotential surface around it, and they have specific potential values. So the points on the surfaces will be having equal potential. Hence, they are, uh, the surface formed by them is known as the equipotential surface. To understand it further, let us consider two masses of uh, two stars of masses, M1 and M2. Here I show M1 and M2, and then they are at a distance R1 and R2 from the center of mass. Then we try to obtain the value of the potential at a distance R from their center of mass. And this expression is given like this. And suppose these two stars are orbiting with an angular frequency of omega. Now we try to solve for the equilibrium points around this system. So to find the point of equilibrium, we just take the derivative of the potential, make it zero. Then we get around five points this, uh, around this uh, system. So these are L1, L2, L3, L4, and L5. These points are known as the Lagrangian points. So in case of two-body system, we have five Lagrangian points. You can see from here. To give you a better idea, I'm sharing two pictures here. Suppose these two are the stars that I was talking about. And suppose one of the stars is a compact object. Suppose this is a neutron star here. And this is a companion star. And they are orbiting with certain angular velocity. So now, uh, 
the roots, uh, the equipotential surface around these uh, stars would be spherical when they are very near to the star, centered on each of the masses. Now, if we move further, this equipotential surface would be distorted and it would form a teardrop shape just near this Lagrangian point, known as the inner Lagrangian point. So near the inner Lagrangian point, this would be distorted because of the gravitational influence of both the stars. So near this inner Lagrangian point, the gravitational influence of both the stars will be equal, but acting in the opposite direction. Now, this surface bounded by the equipotential uh, surface is known as a Rothschild. And now suppose this star grows and it reaches the inner Lagrangian point, then what would happen is that there would be transfer of mass from this star to the compact object forming a dislike structure. This process of mass transfer is known as the Rothschild overflow. So here I'm sharing a 3D picture to give you a better view of this. Suppose this is a star that is the normal star and this is a complex object. So this is accreting from this star forming a disk-like structure and it is the mass transfer is occurring through the inner Lagrangian point. So this accretion disk mostly emits in the X-ray regime of the electromagnetic spectrum. So X-rays, to give you an idea of this, I have shared an electromagnetic spectrum scale where we can see that the X-ray lies in the lower wavelength, that is higher energy. So the photons emitted from this disk will be mostly in the X-ray regime, that is high energy in the electromagnetic spectrum. So the system consisting of two stars, where one of the stars is a normal star and the other star is a compact object, are known as X-ray binaries. They are binary because there are two stars and they emit in X-rays, so X-ray binaries. So here I'm going to talk about two basic terms that we X-ray astronomers use are soft and hard. When we say that soft X-ray, it says that it is in the low energy part of the X-ray spectrum. When we say hard, it is the high energy X-ray. Now, this is the overall picture of the X-ray binaries where we can see a compact object and it is accreting from a companion star forming an accretion disk. Sometimes we see a jet-like structure. I'm not going into the detail of this, but these jets are mostly emitted in the radio band, which is a higher wavelength band. So this is the accretion disk, and it is thought that there exists a layer above the compact object, which is known as corona. So making the long story short, so what we want to know from here is that we have an accretion disk, and there is a layer above the compact object. And the disk mostly emits in the soft band, that is low energy X-ray band. And the corona mostly emits in the hard band, that is high energy X-ray band. So the first X-ray binary discovered was uh, Scorpius X1. It was around 1962. And this is the paper that talks about the discovery. So after that, many more X-ray satellite has been launched. And the first dedicated X-ray satellite that was launched was around 1970. And the name of the satellite was Uhuru. After that, many more new extra satellites have been launched. Here I show the extra satellite, India's extra satellite, that is uh, ISRO's AstroSat. Here I show two pictures. And this picture talks about different payloads that AstroSat has. I have uh, worked on LexPC and SXT. LexPC mostly uh, detects the photons that is in the higher energy part of the X-ray spectrum, and SXT mostly works in the low energy part of the X-ray spectrum. Here I show the scales. So the advantage of AstroSat is that it has a broadband view. It can view both uh, in the low energy and the high energy part of the X-ray spectrum, and it has a fast timing capability. So I was talking about pulsars, like they rotate very fast, and there are many more X-ray phenomena which are very fast and you wouldn't be able to catch them if your telescope and it doesn't have a good timing capability. It should have a very small time resolution so that it can detect the photons coming from those sources within a very short instant of time. So AstroSat has these advantages. So there are many more extra satellites like NICER, NewSTAR, Chandra, XMM, Newton. So these are having very good spectral as well as timing capabilities and which has enriched the field of extra astronomy. There are many more again. So uh, Strobex, EXTP, Rosetta, IXP, Exposet, 
some of them are even proposed. So this will give a better view of the extra sky we have and would develop the high energy um, astrophysical phenomena that we uh, and our understanding about them. So okay, so what do we extra astronomers do? So first of all, I was talking about the extra binaries. We have a compact object, and then it is accreting from a companion star, forming an accretion disk. This disk, disk emits in the X-rays. So <clears throat> here is the astrocyte detector, which is detecting the X-rays coming from the sources. And then we have the uh, photon counts, that is the X-ray photons, and with time. So here I show how these photon counts are varying with time. And we can see the count rate, it changes with time. It is higher here and then it is decreasing. So this plot where we can see the change of the count rate with time is known as the light curves. Then we obtain the spectra, which is which gives the idea of the count rates, how it varies with the energy of the X-ray region. So spectra also gives the idea of the physical mechanisms occurring uh, just um, in the uh, near the all six. So our work is mostly computational and it involves data analysis. Here's a picture of me trying to retrieve some X-ray data from any telescopes. Here I share another light curve where we can show that the uh, how the photon count rates are varying with time. And then I try to draw some vertical lines where we have data of the source with two different telescopes, AstroSat and NICER. So let me give you a rough idea of what I actually work on. So we have this X-ray binary where the compact object is a neutron star. It is accreting from the compact object, forming an accretion disk. And here I share the 2D image of the same. So the disk here, you can see here, this is the disk. This is the compact object. This is a neutron star. And I was talking about a layer that exists as above the neutron star. So the neutron star is accreting, forming an accretion disk, and the disk emits in the soft part of the X-ray region, so low energy X-ray photons. So it is known that the disk, that is the emission from the accretion disk, is mostly uh, following the black body emission. So we can describe the spectra with a black body. Then these soft photons, that is low energy X-ray photons, are moving towards the corona, where it undergoes Comptonization before reaching the observer. Comptonization meaning it undergoes Compton scattering in the corona before reaching the observer. So the photons emitted by the corona are mostly lying in the high energy part of the X-ray spectrum. So the disk emits in the soft X-rays and the photons from the disk moves to the corona where it undergoes Compton scattering before reaching the observer. So the coronal emission is mostly non-thermal, we say, and we try to feed them with the power law emission or power loss model. And the emission from the disk is black body and we try to fit them with black body model. So the basic idea is we get the light curve, we get the spectra. So from the light curve, we can understand how the photons are varying with time and different variabilities of the sources. And from the spectra, we get a rough idea of the physical mechanisms of the emission processes. Like the disk emission we are getting, we try to fit them with the black body. The black body gives the idea of the temperature as well as the radius of the accretion disk. Then the coronal emission also, we try to fit them with some spectra, which gives idea of what is happening there. So long story short, these sources that uh, evolves with time. And for these kind of sources, what we observe is that the accretion disk moves. It moves towards the compact object, this is a 2D picture. This is the accretion disk. This is the neutron star. This is the corona. So the accretion disk moves towards the compact object. It moves away from the compact object. So when it moves towards the compact object, the emission is dominated by the accretion disk. As I was saying that the emission from the accretion disk lies in the soft X-ray part. So when the disk is very close to the compact object, we see the soft X-ray emission, which is dominated. So we can see the same thing from the spectra that is the soft is dominated when the disk is very near to the compact object. As the disk moves away and uh, further away from the compact object, the corona becomes dominated. As the emission from the corona dominates in the hard part of the X-ray spectrum, so we can see from this spectra is that the, it is hard dominated, that is high energy X-ray dominated. So these sources evolve with time and the accretion rate increases and decreases and also they show some 
variation in the corona and the accretion disk emissions. So here I'm going to talk about one of my favorite topic. As I was saying that the neutron star is accreting from the compact object. Then what would happen with the matter that is getting accreted? So it would just accumulate on the surface of the neutron star. So suppose the matter is accumulating, and this accumulating accumulated matter undergoes burning once favorable conditions are reached at the base of this accumulated column, which will result in an increase in intensity of the system. Even you can see from this light curve that the when the matter was accreted, matter uh, then we can see that uh, we have a very small count rate. Then suddenly, there is an intense increase in the intensity of the system. So what we see, the matter is accumulated, then certain conditions are reached, and then it undergoes burning and results in a sudden increase in intensity of the system. These systems are, uh, this process is known as the thermonuclear X-ray burst. So this accumulation takes place for hours, and this, those accumulated matter undergoes burning within a matter of second. So these are also known as a type 1 X-ray burst. So what causes the burning? It depends on many more conditions. Here I share some conditions, like it depends on the chemical composition of the accreted matter. So whatever matter is getting accreted must have some co compositions. Then the temperature of the accreting matter, it should be around 10 to the power 8 Kelvin. Then we should have a column depth of certain values. Oops. And then we have the initial condition set by the previous burst. So here I show one burst like curve. Then in certain cases, we see there are multiple bursts with time. So sometimes some bursts are very close to each other, that the second burst is affected by the previous burst. So it also depends on initial conditions set by the previous burst. So here I show a burst like curve detected by AstroSat itself. So we have a 60 light curve as well as the Lex Fisher light curves of the thermonuclear burst. Now, uh, OK, so under, to understand the physics of this burst, we try to obtain the spectra again, as I was talking about. So here I show the spectra of the burst, which usually follows black body emission. So this hot spot, or the emission from the hot spot, is a black body. But we have recent sensitive and good instruments. And when we try to obtain the spectra from those data, it shows some deviation from the black body, because we have more sensitive data, more decent data, which shows that it doesn't follow only black body. There are some other things going on. So we can see that this deviation, right? So I also study the reason behind such deviations. And yeah, it is highly debated. So some people say that this deviation is mostly because we have the burst spectra, burst emission, and this burst emission is mostly, suppose we have this neutron star here, and we have a hotspot here, which is undergoing thermal burst, and then the emission from the hotspot, they are coming to the accretion disk and then reaches the observer. So they undergo some reflection in the accretion disk. They also go to the corona, where it undergoes some reprocessing before reaching the observer. So because of the burst reflection in the disk or their reprocessing in the corona, it shows some deviation from the black body. These are some basic idea what could happen, what would, which is the, what is the region behind such deviations. So, OK, now I have talked about uh, some basic of my research work. I would like to discuss if someone wants to know more about it. So, OK, so if you really want to pursue astronomy, there are many more major institutes in India. I have tried to note some of them, but there are many more, of course. So I started my astronomy life uh, when I was an MSc student. I did some small projects, which made me interested in the field of ast uh, astronomy. Then I started my PhD in IIT Indore. So I then did my PhD, then here I joined as a postdoctoral researcher. Somehow I found research very interesting. So if you really want to pursue astronomy, so you can just uh, appear for some national e level exams. Like if you want to join IT Indoor, in IT Indoor, it's like you can appear for JAM and then get into MSc or MS programs in physics and astronomy. One good thing about IT Indoor is that they have a separate astronomy department. And then if you want to join as a PhD student, you can go through like GET or NET and then get into an IIT or any other institutes. So 
it's good to do internship even if you are a bachelor student and then you should apply for multiple you know internships and uh, appear for some projects and all which would make you very interested to, to certain fields and you'd know what makes you more interested and then you can pursue in the same field so apply as much as possible and nothing is easy but everything is possible so yeah i'm gonna end this talk sharing a picture of my last eight months here in us but this is my institute texas tech and these are some pictures with my lab mates here uh okay thanks thank you uh thank you so much actually uh the uh, presentation that you just uh, gave uh, was one of the most lucid explanations that are uh, suitable for undergraduates i'd say uh, regarding and, uh, your field of research yeah so now uh, it is up thank to you. the participants uh, to uh, uh, post any questions or any queries that you might have you can just unmute yourself and go ahead with any questions that you might have and uh, if you're afraid to speak up you can also uh, type your uh, question uh, in the chat box Okay, if not, uh, let me go ahead with uh, a question from my side. Uh, yes, are sir. there any uh, explanations why there might be deviations from the Planck uh, curve? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, like, can you go to that slide? Yeah. Okay, sure. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, this picture, yeah. So, mm -hmm. we have the idea that the both spectra will follow Planckian, but we are not observing them like uh, the way we expect them to follow Planckian. So the deviation may be because of the reprocessing that I said. So uh, we have this neutron star, we have the hotspot, the photons coming from the burst, maybe they are reflected in the accretion disk and then coming to us. So this is not di directly coming to us. This is pro possibly undergoing reflection in the accretion disk or the corona where it undergoes reprocessing and then reaching us. So this may result in the deviation from the normal black body. So another is that the, so this burst radiation are po possibly going to the accretion disk and which is dragging the accretion process, which is known as a pointing Robertson drag. So this drag will eventually increase the, uh, increase the, you know, burst radiation. So this is also another reason which is the enhancement of the accretion flow so accretion rate also increases due to the burst impact on the inner part of the accretion disk so that is another proposed thing so the exact reason is still not uh, known uh, so my uh, the best explanation is that it might be an artifact of uh, what we are able to observe with the i mean the telescopes right the process is actually a black body radiation right that is more likely uh no uh, actually, there is something physical going on there. It's okay. not exactly black body. Initially, people thought that it is only black body, but with more sensitive instrument, they, we are seeing some deviations. It is not an artifact, but there is something physical going on there, which we don't understand exactly what is going on. There are some models, but no, we don't clearly understand what is exactly going on there. Uh -huh. And are the observations sensitive enough to fit the theoretical models? I mean, is there some discrepancy in the resolution? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, in one of my work, actually, I did uh, with AstroSat, XL, XPC, and SXT. We tried to fit them with different models. We could actually fit two models, one black body and one another is the disk black body, which says that uh, there is emission coming from the disk as well. So mm -hmm. it gives some rough idea. But if we try to, you know, find some physical parameters from that, the astroset data currently is not that sensitive enough. We tried with NICER to find the reflection emission. With NICER also, we had some issues. 
So we need some good telescope, like people are proposing for strobes and all, which would give, you know, good sensitive observations from where we can just say that, yes, exactly this is happening. So currently we are not, we are not sure about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, so thank you. Yeah, I have a question in the chat box. Mm -hmm. For Raman Deep, uh, he asks, what is the basic principle on which an X-ray telescope works? How are X-ray telescopes different than optical telescopes? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So do you want to awesome. Okay, sorry. What is the basic principle of yeah, so optical telescope is the okay, let me go to the where okay here. So I was talking about the electromagnetic spectrum. So you can see the X-ray lies here and the visible light lies here. So in case of optical telescope, you have some CCDs and all. For in X-ray telescope, you have like, in case of AstroSet, we had the proportional counter. I, I assume that you have learned about the proportional counter, how it works. So this, some of the X-ray telescopes are proportional counter and some are CCDs. So proportional counters are like, you have the photons that is coming and then it is producing some ions, gas are ionized, and then they are collected by the electrodes, which will give you a pulse. So the pulse will more high with the energy, more the energy we are gaining, uh, gaining then we have the higher pulse and that's how we get the photon counts and how the proportional counter works in general. So that is a basic idea, but yeah, astrocet like space is a proportional counter. So yeah, they are mostly proportional counter or a CCD. Yeah, I there think are some well. Sorry? Yeah. Please, please go ahead. Yeah, there are some SSDs as well, silicon reef detectors, like NICER is SSD. Yeah, because the X-rays are very high energy, we have to go a bit different than conventional optical telescopes or IR telescopes. Anyway, yeah. a good question, a good follow-up question for students to ask would be why are space telescopes uh, not terrestrial? They have to be space telescopes. Uh, I mean, X-ray telescopes, not terrestrial. Why are they? Okay, space. yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, so X-rays have a very low wavelength, so they are mostly absorbed by the Earth atmosphere. So we can't observe the X-rays by terrestrial telescope. We have to put them in space itself. But that is the reason behind why they are space telescopes. So I think we have another question uh, from mm -hmm. Neil Power. In a binary star system, what are the distances between the stars? Uh, how is it possible uh, for transfer of matter in large log overflow in such large distance? Okay. Okay. So about the distance, then okay, sure. Uh, I have a binary here somewhere. Yeah. Okay. So we have these uh, stars, uh, binary stars. So we have matter uh, getting transferred from one star to another. So this distance changes, like there are different binaries as well, types of binary. I don't remember uh, the names, uh, there are different names for them. So depending on the distance between them, they are named differently. So moreover, what was the question about the Roth's law? Uh, Roth's law overflow? Okay, so yeah, what I was talking about is that the, about the potential, right? We have the potential values. So we try to solve the potential, we make the derivative. Then we have these points, which are in equilibrium. So as I was saying, it's not getting transferred just like that. It is growing and then this star grows. Then if it reaches the Lagrangian point, then there is a mass transfer because it's unstable. This is the point of, uh, you know, uh, this is the point of, um, unstable equilibrium. So this grows and then it reaches the inner Lagrangian point. Then there is a mass transfer, which is forming a disk around it. So this star has to grow. If it doesn't grow, there is no transfer of matter. So, yeah. Okay, so uh, Himanshu, I, I wanted to ask a a question actually yeah, okay, so, uh, yeah uh, dr unati uh, just uh, can you uh, show the potential of the roche loop that you were just talking about yeah this potential for two body system yeah 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 correct so uh, mm -hmm. i just wanted to ask you it, it's just a basic question uh, how mm -hmm. do you uh, get to know about the potential actually i mean uh, the mathematical form that you have okay. written 
Yeah. Okay, okay. So we have these two masses. So I didn't go into the detail of mathematics. It would make really boring. So I just gave the expression. So we have these masses. So here we have a test mass, suppose M. So the force on this mass because of this mass would be ZMM by, you know, R potential. Sorry, this is the expression of the potential. Then we have for this mass, we have a similar expression. And then this mass will experience a centrifugal force, which is given by this equation. And this potential right. expression is coming basically from the centrifugal force expression. expression. All right, all right, thank you. Yeah. yeah. So are there any more questions from the students? And you can also ask any career related questions if you want to. I tried to make it very basic so that people understand. Hopefully, people understood what I explained. No, it, it was absolutely on target, actually. I mean, the, the, it, it was required. I mean, uh, because most of our students, I mean, they are not introduced to astronomy, at least at the undergraduate level. So. Mm -hmm. With this, I think it will be, uh, they'll have at least some basic idea about X-ray astronomy and other such things. Yeah. Uh, Pukuda, if there are no more questions. Uh... Yeah, uh, if uh, <laughs> there are no more questions, then uh, I would like to just present the vote of thanks. So it's just a formality. So anyway, uh, uh, from the core of my heart, I would like to thank Dr. Unnati Kashyap for taking out time from her busy schedule. The talk was interesting, and I strongly believe that the audience have benefited a lot. Regarding the topic of today's presentation, I could learn a lot regarding the basics of binary astronomy and, of course, your research expertise. I hope you also enjoyed interacting with our students. Thank you once again. And last but not the least, yeah. I must thank the audience for supporting us from the very beginning. Since the exams are very near, I would like to wish very best. Uh, we shall meet again after your exam with a lot of uh, new and exciting topics. Also, I would like to thank uh, Pintu as well as uh, Himanshu for organizing such a wonderful talk. That's all from my side, Himanshu. Over to you. Yeah, yeah. And also, thank you from my side for actually agreeing to deliver this talk on such short notice. And I think uh, it's really early, early morning there. So <laughs> thank you for lending some of thank yours. You. Yeah, uh, uh, Himanshu, uh, mm -hmm. probably there is one more question. Uh, like, uh, uh, Dr. Unnati, would you like to address that? Uh, okay. uh, what is it? What what is are the differences it? between MSc and MS degrees in IITs? OK, uh, there are different. OK, MS are mostly engineering or you know applied basis, what I have understood seeing the students there. So for MS, there are criteria like you need a paper within two years. That is another criteria there in IIT. So MS is mostly applied. MSc is mostly how we do in science, whatever we do, like MSc. So that's a basic difference. In fact, Nilpavan, uh, I can tell you for IIT indoors that they have an MS research degree and an MSc degree as well. To get entry into the MSc degree, you can appear for uh, IIT Jam, and but MS degree they, uh, it requires gate actually. So that is one difference, and also there are technical differences such as the duration of coursework. In the MSc degree, you have one year coursework, coursework, and in the MS by research degree, you just start off research right away after the first semester itself. So those are some technical differences. So you can explore more. It's very well written in the uh, department web page actually. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, yeah, thank you so much. So any final remarks? <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, so Himanshu, so as I already said, Dr. Unnati, so let us know when you will be in Guwahati so that uh, we can invite you over to Hendrick College so that uh, you can inspire some of our students. They would really love to interact with you. And yeah, sure. Uh, uh, yeah, can I get your email or something so that? Sure, sure. Uh, I'll, I'll ask along. Himanshu, uh, no problem. Yeah. I'll ask Himanshu to share with you. And yeah. uh, how did you uh, like the, I mean, the environment or was it interesting for you as well? Yeah, it was really good. I really liked it. I have never given a public talk. This was my first public talk and I really liked it. It was a good experience, yeah. Okay, thank you. So uh, Himanshu, I think uh, it's over from our side. I think we can wrap it up, right? Yeah. So, yeah thank you. Um, All right. Yeah. All right.
Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank Take you. care. Yeah.